Hey everyone, this is Josh from Solopreneur Grind for episode 82 of the Solopreneur Grind podcast. I'm happy to be joined by Krista from leanoutmethod.com. Krista, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome, Krista. Great to have you here. And for those who may have not heard of you before, can you give us a brief intro? Who is Krista? What are you working on these days? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a lean business consultant. I do a few different things. So I consult with Fortune 50 companies and I really help them introduce lean and agile ways of working, um, as well as working with solopreneurs, mostly in the coaching, consulting, entrepreneurial space to apply some of those same lean practices into their business so that they can really learn how to achieve more by doing less, by really getting clear on the things that are actually going to make a difference in their business eliminating everything else and i also have a global accessories brand and i'm a jewelry designer oh, wow. so i kind of have a, a nice <laughs> span of things going on there yeah and, and it sounds like you probably practice what you preach as well right uh, in your own business i would think krista can you firstly tell us what do the words lean and agile mean as they relate to business yeah, absolutely. So lean was born, you know, back in the early 1900s and it was it came out of the uh, manufacturing space. And it's really all about eliminating waste, right? It's getting the highest amount of quality and value possible with the lowest number of defects and waste, right? So it's something that I think just makes so much sense that any kind of business is going to want is no waste, high quality, high value, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's super applicable. When you're thinking of agile, agile is just what it sounds like, right? It's an agile way of working. It's a very adaptive, dynamic way of working, where instead of in more traditional business where you would do a lot of upfront planning and you might with a lot of detail pre-plan exactly what you're going to do pretty far into the future, agile is much more dynamic. You do things in these small little sprints. So you, you know, you do your longer term roadmap, but in the shorter term, you're more dynamically making decisions about what to do and what to focus on based on what you're learning as you go along. Got it. And correct me if I'm wrong, agile seems to be a pretty popular term amongst startups with, with their tech teams as well, but obviously it can be applied a little bit further beyond that. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. We are on the same page. So with that being said, Krista, and thank you for that, for that bit of an intro, uh, can you take us back to when your professional career started? I, I'm, I, we don't have to start here, but I am interested in learning about your journey of getting to the point of, of teaching lean, teaching agile, obviously uh, key terms, important terms for these days. But how did your career start? What, where, what did you take in school and, and what was kind of the first step after that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was younger, I always knew that I wanted to do my own thing. I was always fairly entrepreneurial. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted my own business. And as somebody who's very creative, but also very structured and someone who loves to plan, I'm a very weird mix. Um, <laughs> I ended up going to college for fine art and graduating with a business degree in management information systems. So <laughs> I kind of blended both of what I did. Mm -hmm. um, and when I graduated school, well, like many, you know, many kids who graduate college, large amount of uh, college loan debt. And I had said, you know, what, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to work probably in corporate for a few years. Let me pay this down while I'm figuring out what I want to do for my own business. It'll give me, you know, that runway to do that. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was managing a Starbucks and one of my morning customers had actually offered me a consulting job. He mm -hmm. said, I have this opportunity. I think you'd be perfect for it. No, you just graduated with an MIS degree. Would you like to come join this company? I'd like for you to start tomorrow. The only way to do that is if if you come in as a consultant. Right. I honestly didn't even know what a consultant was at the time. It sounded great to me. <laughs> I said, sure, the pay was amazing. Um, so that started my journey. And just as consulting kind of came about organically, the company I ended up consulting with was a big lean manufacturing company. Hmm. And can, so can I just pause you quickly, Krista? Yeah. How does a Starbucks manager end up getting a job offer to start tomorrow for something like consulting. I'm assuming that there has to be more to this, right? I'm sure. But was this uh, a client that came in a lot that learned, you know, saw you in action? How, where did that, how did that come about? 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, anytime you're in a service based uh, role, right, anytime you whether you're a waitress, which I did that, too, or you work in a company like Starbucks, right, you have your regulars. Mm -hmm. And he was one of my regular morning customers. I knew his drink. I'd see him coming from a mile away and I'd have mm -hmm. it ready by the time he even got up to the register. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I developed a relationship with all my morning customers. I was there for five years. So I knew them pretty well. And, you know, we would get chatting and we'd talk about, you know, how's the weather, but we'd also talk about, so what do you want to do with your life? Kind of what do you hmm. want to be when you grow up type of thing. Right. And but his drink was already ready. How much time did you ready. spend chatting? chatting? Yeah, we did. We still, we I guess still he chat. would, he would he hang around. Yeah. Adding his sugar and okay. <laughs> cream and everything That's to it. That's very good service. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember what he drank too. It yeah. was twenty something years ago, and I could still tell you his drink. <laughs> right. So, what what do you think it was that because as great as I'm sure that was, right, having the drink ready, chit chatting, there's still a big stretch going from that to consulting, right, for for a big business. What do yeah. you think were maybe like the two or three factors that really made him think, you know, what I think this this girl Krista would be a really good fit for this job. I mean, I really, I had, I was very, I will say mature for my age in a lot of ways. I don't think I was ever really a kid. I was mm -hmm. kind of born an adult. <laughs> yeah. And so, especially, you know, when you looked at me compared to my peers, I was in my very early twenties managing a Starbucks. Um, I had teams of people who I managed. And so mm -hmm. I think he saw that dynamic on a pretty regular basis being a regular. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't uncommon that he'd sit in there and work for a couple hours. So he had a lot of opportunity to actually observe me working. Um, so I think that was part of it. And also, I think he just knew from our conversations what I wanted out of life and that it happened to align with what he was looking for. So mm -hmm. I think it was a combination of that plus trusting in me to be able to deliver based on seeing me in action for so long. Got it. Okay, so he gives you this offer. You still don't know what consultant means. What like what did you do that evening? Did you go home, research? Uh, what happened next? Yeah, absolutely. I'm such a researcher. <laughs> I'm such a planner. So the first thing I did is, you know, I'd asked him as many questions as I could. And then I spent the night on my friend Google, you know, trying to to figure out everything I could so that I could show up prepared the next day. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing I ended up doing was going into the consulting agency that was going to be placing me in negotiating salary and getting all that done. And then I started um, at 10 a.m. that next morning. Jeez. And so I'm trying to figure out what do you even ask for as a consultant? I'm not quite sure. And so he had given me some ideas on a range, but it was really up to them. And right. they paid me way more than I thought that I would ever make just graduating from college. Right. Um, so it was it was a pretty great experience, but a little bit nerve wracking. <laughs> I bet. So so how does that work? They, they place you, he placed you with an agency that would then place you at his factory? Yeah, so anytime you're in the corporate space, it's really difficult as an individual to go into a company. Right. So what typically happens is you end up having to get placed through a consulting agency. Mm -hmm. um, and so what he did was he set me up with one of the pre-approved consulting agencies wow. that he knew would be able to process me that morning and get me in the door the next day, like literally that right. day. <laughs> Jeez. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Okay, so let's hear about um, what exactly did he have you doing and how the heck did you figure out how to help them do it? Like, you know, this is brand new, right? Completely. And so I should mention that I had actually managed businesses from the time I was 16. And I had actually run two coffee shops. I opened up um, the very first drive through coffee shop ever in the state of Connecticut. Hmm. Um, it was one of those old little photo booths that had been converted. Um, I'd managed a bakery. So I had a lot of experience managing. And that was something else that he knew. And so when I came in, the role that I was given was basically a project manager. I wasn't called that. I was called a move coordinator, which sounds so much less fun. Yeah. Um, but it was really a project management role, which I realized pretty quickly when I got into it. And that was what I loved so much about it because I had always done management, but I'm thinking I just graduated from college. I don't have 
any you know real track record who's going to hire me at some big company as some sort of manager or leader straight out of school and i ended up actually getting into that role thanks to him which mm-hmm. was amazing your first job out of college as a manager right, right. um so, so, so how, how did great. that how did, has that flipped then your your because you just told me a very common kind of thought process that a new grad would have, which is I'm a new grad. Why should I be hired to do X or Y Mm -hmm. or is it, you know, insert higher level job here type thing. Um, So it did that or or since then, have you changed your outlook in that regard? Or maybe another way to ask the question is if a recent grad were to come to you and say, Krista, you know, I'm I'm recently graduated, but I really want to do X, Y or Z. That's not a typical fresh out of college or university type role. What would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you a little bit about my story, too, because it was really interesting. But what I would say to them is I think you have to know what you're capable of today versus what you aspire to do tomorrow. And I think there is a difference. And if you aspire to do that, then I think that you want to set those expectations very clearly with wherever you go to work or whatever you're even doing if you're working with, you know, an entrepreneur and and part of a small business team, right? You want to set those expectations and say, you know, I understand I may not have these skills today, but this is what I want to do. What opportunities can or what things can I take on now to Mm -hmm. learn those skills so I'm ready for that role? Um, And if you have those skills today, what I would say kind of lesson learned is if you can demonstrate that you actually do have those skills, people will usually take a chance on you. Um, I found that repeatedly throughout my career. I had to fight really hard for things sometimes, but people did ultimately take a chance on me and I proved that I could do it over and over again. So they kept taking bigger chances. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a great lesson. I mean, ultimately, if you're trying to get somewhere great, there's going to be some tough times, right? Everybody's road's going to be windy and, and uphill at certain points. So, so yeah, that, that's a great point. So Krista, take us back to you, you start work and you're figuring it out, whatever it is. What were kind of the first six months like? And then what was the next step of the journey? Honestly, I would say my the reason I was as successful as I was and what a lot of those first six months were like, and I think this is true for anybody, anytime you do something new, it's relationship building. It was understanding what I needed to do and then going out and personally talking to people and learning as much as I could and being in a place of service and how could I help them. Um, The nature of being a move coordinator was I was taking our business and moving us from one physical building to another physical building. And the beautiful thing about that was I literally moved every single person in the company. So I touched every single person in the company. So I set up meetings with every single person in the company. It did not matter if they were, you know, the account executive or the person who was doing tech support. I met with absolutely everybody. And I would always ask, you know, what can I do to make sure that this move is completely seamless, you know, for you? Um, And I delivered on that, but it gave me such um it just it it gave me a lot of confidence which is great but b Mm -hmm. it gave me a lot of flexibility in what i did next because everybody knew me and i actually delivered on what i said i was going to do so Mm -hmm. they immediately trusted me um which was huge right that's great so so obviously performed very well and then what was the next step from there Yeah. So, you know, I, throughout the past 20 years have continued consulting. Um, I've gone through a lot of different companies. I stayed with that company for about seven years. Um, And then from there, I moved on to several other companies. Right now I'm working with a Fortune 10 company. Um, And so I very much enjoyed and liked the consulting space, um, really working with businesses to help them lean out and introduce those lean practices. And just, you know, it's really all about being first to market, having really good products that are very customer centric, making sure that you're really focused on your profitability and your value in eliminating waste so that you don't have unnecessary overhead. Um, And so that's what I've been doing and I absolutely love it. And throughout that journey, I started my jewelry business. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) I finally figured out what I wanted to do Mm -hmm. and I started my jewelry business. And this was probably about 15 years ago or so now. Um, And I ended up, having a little handmade jewelry business at first that I eventually ended up closing and launching what is today. My business is called Chris Cara. 
And I ended up scaling the business really quickly. And I actually scaled it too quickly. Mm -hmm. And I almost put myself out of business. <laughs> um, and that is when the lean out method was born um, for more, you know, small businesses, whether they're product based or service based, like coaches and consultants and entrepreneurs. Because as I was going through that journey, I realized that here I'm helping all of these big, huge corporations have all of this success leveraging lean and agile and I'm not leveraging it in my own business mm -hmm. and I ended up looking at you know how can I take these concepts that work for them and apply them down to a small business and when I did that in my business that was what made all the difference um, and that's mm -hmm. why that business is still you know alive and thriving really well today awesome and and I definitely want to get more into the methodology strategy etc for that but First, Krista, I'm, I'm curious. So you finished the first job and, and you're still working through that kind of like staffing consultancy company. And then w was it just a matter of getting more and more contracts for that same end client through that same staffing company or kind of how, how did those next few projects come about? Yeah. So what ended up happening, actually, as I mentioned, I was a move coordinator, which was really a project manager, but without the title. Mm -hmm. um, and so when that job was done, um, I had the opportunity to kind of pick, if you will, what I do next. Mm -hmm. And what I had said was, I've been doing project management, I want to be a project manager. And I actually got a lot of pushback, right? This was 20 something years ago, there were not a lot of women who are project managers. Anybody who was a project manager was in their 40s. <laughs> they were my age now, right? They weren't 20 something just out of college. And so I got a ton of pushback on wanting to be a project manager, but I fought really, really hard for it. And again, people took a chance on me. I did really well. And what happened was I really quickly went from being a project manager to a senior project manager, to a program manager, to a senior program manager. And then I took over global uh, project management offices. So I had PMOs in um, eight or nine different countries with different project managers all over the world reporting to me. And so I had done that with that first company and then moved on and did the same thing at other companies. Um, and now I Got just it. consult, but for a long time I had run these big, huge teams and basically taught other people how to do what I did. Right, so can you tell us a little bit more about, would you consider that consulting or or how exactly would you do because it almost it almost sounds like you're being hired as a contractor to be a project manager with that company which might be a little bit different from i don't i don't know maybe you would call like strategic consulting or management consulting yeah yeah today i do management consulting at that time i think you're absolutely right i would probably call it a little bit more contracting um mm -hmm. hired for specific jobs um or specific roles today i'm a straight up consultant Got right. It. It's I am a management consultant today. Got it. Um, but and I was in the beginning when I first started as well. But for a period there, I went through and you could definitely say contract. There were times I actually took roles as a full time employee as opposed to coming in mm -hmm. as a consultant, because honestly, it was far better from a benefit and salary perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of went, you know, where the the work was. But I tended to stay with companies for about a year. Right. I was there to do a job. And when that job was done, I moved to a different company regardless. Got it. And were you getting these new clients, we'll call them, or employers? Was that through word of mouth? Were you constantly keeping marketing in mind or sales in mind? No, it was quite interesting, right? There was only one of those that I ever went out and sought myself. <laughs> um, all of the others, I just was kind of known in that space. And so people would come to me and usually what would end up happening is somebody would approach me and I'd say, listen, I'm currently working on something. I should be wrapping this up in about two months. I'd be happy to come and do this for you when I wrap that up, but I want to see this through to the end. And mm -hmm. most times people would say yes. And so that's what happened. So I always had something else lined up before something else ended because I used to have people just reaching out to me a lot and right. I would just kind of pick the ones that were most aligned with what I wanted to do next. Right. Very cool. And so other than, of course, doing really good work, what do you think contributed to that? Or, or what would you recommend, you know, maybe someone's just breaking into consulting right now or, or they're struggling to grow their own business? Other than, of course, being really good at the product or service that you're providing, uh, what do you think it was that allowed for that to happen or, or contributed to that? consistent flow of, of clients coming in without even really having to do much else. 
Yeah. I mean, it's so different today, right? As I'm trying to grow the lean out method and I'm doing all the marketing and mm-hmm. all right, totally different than everything just naturally kind of coming to me. Honestly, I think it's a lot of transparency in doing what you say you're going to do. And so, yes, you obviously have to be really you know, good at what you do, especially if you're in a specialist role, people are looking for a certain result from that. So mm-hmm. you certainly want to deliver it. But I think you just need to be really transparent, right? People are usually really understanding. Um, What I saw so many of my peers doing, especially in the project management space, is they would know from the beginning that they weren't going to hit a date or that something wasn't going to happen. And they'd wait until it was missed and then come up with a whole lot of different excuses as to why it wasn't and why it wasn't their fault. Whereas I was always super transparent, right? I was very, hey, guys, I think we're at risk here. Here's what I'm seeing. I think we need to make these changes if we're going to actually be able to hit your targets. If not, here's what I see. And I was always super transparent. And so we were Mm -hmm. able to get ahead of things. And it's not that I never had anything go wrong because we all do, Mm -hmm. but I never had a client surprised by something. Right. I think that's such such a great point, especially in, I mean, it applies so strongly to any service business. And I was actually surprised when I had started my own legal practice and, and it was a few years in and getting referrals and people were really happy. And I was almost surprised because I was like, is this not how every service provider treats their clients, right? You're supposed to treat them well, right? And be honest and be upfront and keep them updated. Apparently that's not every service you know, provider in the world. Um, so it's almost funny that just be, working hard, being honest, being transparent, like that puts you in the upper echelon, right? Like mm-hmm. in and of itself. I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but uh, that's the world we live in, right? Um, awesome. Yeah. So Krista, I, I'm selfishly very interested in how you kind of, we'll call it like niche down or pivoted or, or just started focusing more on management consulting. That has been just a, a topic and occupation that has interested me a little bit more in the last uh, six months. How did that come to be? Did you hit a point where you were kind of like, uh, this you know project man- management stuff is fun, but I don't want to do it anymore. Or what was it a management consulting gig that kind of one of them just kind of set you to the moon on that path? Or, or how did that come to be? Yeah, absolutely. So I probably stopped doing project management back in maybe 2005, 2007 timeframe. Um, so I had done that for quite a while. And then I moved over and started doing more in the lean and agile space. Mm-hmm. And in that space, the need was much more in a management consultant role. And so it's more um, force multiplication, right? It's like you're coming in and you're enabling an organization to transform. And I just really, really loved that piece of it. I wasn't there to do the work. I was there to lead a transformation and to teach um, and enable other people to be able to do that work and carry it forward when I leave. Um, And I just personally found that so much more fulfilling because you're affecting a bigger um, piece of the business, a bigger transformation in the business. And it's more lasting, right? As much as it's fulfilling to get something done and accomplish something for somebody, I find it more fulfilling to actually help a business completely transform the way they operate and to be able to work in a new way when you're gone. Absolutely. Yeah, could you take a minute and, and quickly to explain, number one, what is what would you, dis, you know, define management consulting to be? And then number two, was it, like I'm curious as to how you kind of came into that role and obviously did a really good job in it. Was that an easy transition from a project manager or was it because you had so much previous experience in you know lean and, and agile strategies? Like how how did you take it upon yourself to jump in? Because like you said, that that's big, right? Going into what what I understand to be very large companies and now you're designing and like calling the shots. So So how do you... How do you do that? <laughs> I know. I will say the first time um, that I got hired, it was by a CIO. And at the time, he had brought me in to do Agile. And I hadn't done Agile previously. I had been mm-hmm. more in the traditional project management space. And I talked to him and I was like, are you sure you want me to do this? Like he was bringing me in to work with the C-suite execs as a consultant. Um, and he wanted me to come in and introduce Agile and basically transform this entire company. And I was like, I don't actually have Agile experience. <laughs> Yeah, and he said, but you, you were do. transparent. Yeah, <laughs> you just don't realize you do. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't realized that the way that I had done project management wasn't what people would have called waterfall, which is that like 
pre-planning in advance. I had always done it in a very agile way. And I think it was because of that strong lean background that I had. Mm -hmm. And so I just had the opportunity present itself yet again. This was somebody who found me, mm -hmm. asked me if I would come in and do it. Um, so I said yes. And then from there, I had many other opportunities like that come about and I tend to work with some pretty senior leaders in these companies um, or I'm brought in through the senior leaders and then I work with their middle management team and their teams to actually make it happen. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a little intimidating in the beginning. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I mean, everyone starts somewhere, right? Yep. Especially every everyone at the top or like doing big, big things, right? Everyone had their first project, their first job, their first uh, et cetera, et cetera. But can, can you clarify a little bit more? Like, how would you define management consulting for those who may not have heard the term before? And what was that first project like? How did you tackle it? I mean, it, it sounds like you actually knew a lot of what to do, maybe just different terminology, but how did you go in there and, and get the project done? Yeah, absolutely. So for management consulting, I mean, I really see that as somebody that's coming in and truly consulting with a leadership to introduce change. Um, and so it can be change on many different levels. I tend to do a lot of organizational change. Um, mm -hmm. You can certainly be a management consultant and do other types of change, but it's really just introducing a transformation and really, to me, teaching other people how to sustain that after you're gone. That's mm -hmm. what I consider it to be. You're coming in as that outside expert. Um, people are looking to you to basically design a solution, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and then you know give them the tools and the knowledge and the skill and the ability to be able to do it after you leave. Got it. And so in practice, I'm assuming that really depends by, you know, depending on the company, depending on the project. But this is this a matter of, I mean, in order to, create and implement a plan like that, you have to, I would assume, intimately know the, the inner workings of the company. Can you describe a little bit, like from start to finish of a big project like that, you know, new company says, hey, Krista, we want you to come in and implement Agile across our company. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Are you going in, you know, spending a few weeks getting to know people, those intro meetings that you had talked about previously? I'm very curious to know what, what that process looks like and how long a project like that might last for? It can be years, honestly, depending on what you're trying to do. But usually, like anything, you try to take a small pocket that mm -hmm. you can get some quick learnings and some quick results from that you can then grow and expand, but fully to transform a big business. I mean, some of these companies I've been at are 30,000 employees, right? It's not it's not yeah. something you're gonna do really quickly. I was with them for three years. Um, and so it's sometimes that's what's needed, but I didn't start transforming 30,000 people. I started transforming a hundred people. Right. And then from there you grow. Right. And so the first step, absolutely. I'm a very big fan of there's nothing textbook. There's nothing prescriptive. There's you need to get really clear with your client on what their outcomes are and what their end result is. And when you know what that is, and then you can deeply understand their context. So where are they starting from? What's their company culture like? What are some of the constraints and things that are gonna get in the way of working in the way that you know that they need to work? And really trying to understand that. And just as you said, interviews are key, right? You have to meet with different leaders, but I like to meet with people at all levels of the organization because often the more senior the leader, the more disconnected they are from the day-to-day -day of what really happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I like to do the, the full span um, of control, if you will, from senior leader down to hands-on keyboard people to really understand what's happening and where their true starting place is, which is sometimes a little different from where they think their starting place is. Mm -hmm. um, and then we map out what that transformation journey will look like to get them to their end state. Again, trying to get a smaller piece where you can get some real tangible value, measure and see how it's working, and then pivot and adjust as you need to, to layer on that kind of next piece. Got it. Very cool. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. So Krista, in all of this, where did you find the time to start your own company? Um, and you know, th did you have a lull in work or was this is just uh, the calling that you couldn't avoid? 
Exactly. Yeah. It's um, one of the nice things about being lean, right, is I help people a lot with trying to figure out balance, especially balance if they're doing multiple things, right? Maybe they're building a business while they already have a job, or maybe they're in a place like I am right now where they're in a transition state, where they're going from one thing that they're doing, where they want to move towards something different, but there's an overlap period where you're doing more than one thing at once, mm -hmm. right? And it's you just have to be super lean <laughs> in that place right you you there's no room for waste you just have to be really really intentional about everything that you do and if you do that really strategically you can absolutely do multiple things like i do and build a business while you're consulting very full time <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and still do it without completely burning yourself out or really overwork and overwhelm absolutely Makes a ton of sense. So take us to the start of the lean out method. You, you said that was kind of brought upon by this jewelry business where you kind of had a taste of your own medicine, so to speak. Uh, how did that come to be? Yeah, absolutely. So at the time that I had started my jewelry business, the way that companies like mine kind of hit the market was you would go and do the trade shows. So you'd go around, you know, they're pretty expensive to invest in the trade shows. You're flying all over, you're flying all your product and your booth design with you. You're meeting with all these different retailers. Um, at the time, uh, most buyers, um, they expected product immediately. So you would design a collection, you would pre-invest in the collection, and you would hope people bought the collection. Um, as you can imagine, that did not always work out as well as I had wanted it to in the early days. Um, and so we had, you know, approached it the way that we thought we were supposed to approach it. My husband and I, he was a partner with me in the business at the time. Um, and what ended up happening was the the market shifted pretty dramatically buyers stopped going to trade shows buyers changed their buying expectations and no longer needed product immediately um, the whole kind of world of accessories and fashion had shifted at that time and so we were left with a lot of product that didn't sell on the shelf hundreds of thousands of dollars of business debt um, <laughs> without the revenue coming in from it and again it just kind of struck me that I approach this business as opposite from what I teach my corporate clients to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and why did I do that? And why am I not leveraging these same practices? So I did take a lot of what I did and said, okay, how can I lean out my whole manufacturing process? How can I simplify what I'm doing? How can I drive my costs down? How can I reimagine my business model? So I'm not taking on all of the expense and risk up front. And I'm instead doing small, like minimum viable product type runs of a new collection, getting it in front of buyers to see what they invest in before I produce the product. And so I completely changed the way that I did my business. And in doing so, a lot of other businesses that were also struggling because everybody in the fashion accessory space was really struggling a lot at that time, started coming to me and saying, what are you doing? <laughs> Can you help me? Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, coaches and consultants and other service providers started coming to me and asking if I could help them. And that's kind of how the lean out method was born. Got it. And so how do you how do you define it? And and because, you know, we, we have listeners from a wide variety of, you know, different professions and, and industries and et cetera, et cetera. Is there kind of like a couple or one or, or many general principles that uh, that people should be applying no matter what type of business they have or are thinking of yeah. starting? Yeah, absolutely. So there's four pillars. There's context, clarity, commitment, and Kaizen. And so context is just getting really clear on what's important, right? So what is your long-term vision for your company, um, for yourself and your lifestyle and how that fits with your business, right? Are you actually building a business that fits the role that you want to play in the company and the lifestyle that you want to have personally, um, as well as your customer, right? What is your customer over time going to want from your business and does your business model support that? So starting with that context of understanding where you're going, why it's important, um, and then setting those goals to get really clear about, you know, what's important now. So vision to me answers the question of, is this a good fit for the business as you're evaluating different things and your goals, your short-term goals help you understand if it's the right thing right now. And both of those things combined to me are kind of the key of a lean business. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the context section. Also included in that is your actual business model itself. Then when you get into clarity, that's all about your planning, right? That's building your roadmap, that's building your plans, that's figuring out what do I need to focus on right now in the next 90 days that's actually going to help me realize my vision and goals. 
Um, commitment is making the commitment to actually go in and do whatever it takes. And commitment is bigger than just saying I'm going to hit my goals, but it's also committing to working through things when things don't go according to plan or when you have those mindset challenges and barriers that come up for so many of us, especially as we take our businesses to new levels. Um, and then Kaizen is a lean concept uh, that means making small continuous improvements. So it's mm -hmm. the art of constantly reflecting and measuring and seeing how you're doing and making those small adjustments before things go too far and you end up having to make big dramatic changes. Got it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and, and it sounds like a great system. What would you say, Krista, is the biggest uh, struggle or maybe even one of those or multiple of those mistakes or, or, or areas that most business owners are getting wrong or, or problems that you find yourself most often kind of diagnosing when you're working with clients? Yeah, one of the things that I find is, right, so many people come to me because they're in that state of overwork and overwhelm. They're on the verge of burnout. They want to take their business to the next level, but they just feel like they can't add a single other thing to their plate. They know there like has to be a simpler way to approach things, but they just are so stuck in the weeds. They can't raise their head up enough to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's why they come to me. And what I usually find, honestly, is they have a vision and goals. They have a big, giant, long to-do list of things to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and there is absolutely no connection and bridge between the two. Right. It's If you look at how they spend their time, it is not in support of the things that are actually going to make their vision and goals a reality. Right. Yeah. As, as someone who's run multiple businesses now for a few years, I, that does not surprise me to hear that uh, because I've probably been guilty of it a few times. Makes a lot of sense. Krista, uh, I'm curious... What would you recommend for those who are selling B2B? They're, they're trying to sell services of whatever kind, management consulting, some other type of consulting. Um, what would you recommend as advice, especially if someone was on the newer end of trying to sell the big businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think it's true, honestly, of any type of business, but especially in this space, you have to be really, really clear exactly what you do and what you specialize in and who you do it for. I think especially for an emerging business or a newer business, we tend to want to say yes to all the things and do all the things for all the people um, because you're trying to find that product market fit and you're trying to get to that place of profitability. But I think that far earlier than that, usually we know at least who we don't want to work with and who we don't want to serve. Even if we haven't pinpointed and niched down enough yet to know exactly what we want to do and who we want to do it for, we know what we don't want to do. And I think that's where that vision comes in and just you've got to say no to the wrong things to create the space for the right things. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, that's just so incredibly important is as quickly as possible, figure out what you do and what makes you different and what your specialty is and who specifically you want to serve. Because when you have both of those, business isn't that hard. Mm -hmm. It's when you're trying to go way too broad and you're not really clear, that's when things get really complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. If, if you kind of boil it down and if you keep, keep your business and your strategy simple, uh, it's not easy, but it's not, no. it's not you know, a complex uh, process we're dealing with, right? In fact, keeping it simpler usually makes it simpler. Uh, in that regard. Krista, the other thing, kind of one of the last topics I want to touch on is we've covered a lot of really cool strategies, methodology. You know, you've had a very interesting career, uh, project managing, management consulting, starting your own jewelry business. What do you do, if anything at all, to kind of stay up to date or, or to learn or, or to improve yourself? Are you, are you a fan of reading? Do you take courses? Do you have a coach? Uh, or do you just trial by fire? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of being a lifelong learner. I think that's honestly part of that lean and agile mindset is just being a lifelong learner. So yes, I absolutely have a coach. I believe everybody should have a coach. I believe you should be a little wary of hiring a coach who doesn't have a coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, um, and I do, I read a lot. I read probably about two or three books a week. Um, that's honestly oh, wow. how I relax. <laughs> yeah. So I love to read um, and I do occasionally I will invest in a program or, you know, I used to do a lot of retreats and conferences and things of that nature. These days, obviously not as much, but I mm -hmm. look forward to when I can do that again. <laughs> For sure. And, and so one low hanging fruit and then another selfish question is uh, so number one, 
Do you have two or three book recommendations for someone who might want to get into management consulting or, or you know, lean methodology? And then secondly, uh, what was my secondly question? Maybe start with that first one and the second one will come back to me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I really love The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. I think that's a great book. Definitely something that folks should familiarize themselves with if they want to go anywhere in the lean space. Um, on the 100% non-related end of the spectrum, really big fan of the book, The Big Leap. Um, mm. And I think that that just really helps you get clear on what your unique zone of genius is. Um, and especially for those in the earlier or emerging stages, figuring out what you do incredibly well and what makes you really unique, I think is so helpful in getting to that product market fit and um, you know, really just kind of carving out your space. Got it, awesome. And lastly, Krista, if, if we do have some listeners that, um, you know, they are working nine to fives themselves or they're just getting started with their own business. Do you have one or two general pieces of advice for those types of people that are looking to break out on their own or they already have, but they're, you know, struggling at the beginning as, as many of us do? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you have to accept is anytime you're in business, right, you want to have things be kind of a straight line. Like, and what I mean by that is, let's say you want to work 40 hours a week. Well, you want to get to the place that you have this really consistent 40 hour a week, but anytime you're doing something new, you've got an overlap. And so for a period of time, you've just got to accept that you're going to have to on the side dedicate time to your business, but you don't want to at the same time sacrifice everything in your personal life. So what I think you need to do is get really intentional about how much time are you going to put towards growing this business while you have your day job, because you're going to end up having that overlap time until you can make it successful. And then just make really, really sure that the things that you're doing are the right things. Set that vision as far into the future as you can. You probably don't have it all figured out yet, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but just as far as you know what you can see, set that, set some near-term goals, and make sure that the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis are taking you towards those goals and that you're not spending time getting sucked into a lot of the bright, shiny objects of do use this tool, watch this webinar, mm -hmm. <laughs> do all the different things that are going to seem very important, but that are kind of imposed upon you. Um, instead, I say usually get a coach or find somebody who can help you fast track and make the most of those few hours that you have. So you're getting the, the maximum value out of it. Absolutely. That's a great note to end on, Krista. Really appreciate you sharing your stories, your insights, your strategies. If people want to learn more about you or your companies or connect with you, where do you recommend that they go? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Krista Grosso, and you can find me online at leanoutmethod.com. Awesome. Krista, thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me.